Folks, Eric Flint. Uh, we're starting. Uh, Dragon Con was uh, was nice enough to allow us to host the. Uh, we have this convention once a year uh, for fans of 1632 series, and Come the on. first five years we held it on site. Well, not in Mannington, in Fairmont, West Virginia, <coughs> close to the town of Mannington, which is the actual model for Granville. After five years, because, you know, about two-thirds of people who came were sort of regulars, and honestly, only so many times you can visit Mannington, West Virginia. <laughs> now, it's a nice little town, but it's a town of 3,500 people. It's just, there is literally not a... Two's county over under. There's not one motel in that town. You actually have to stay in Fairmont. Um, so what we've done since then is every year moves around the country and a different, we have a different convention hosting it. Next year it's going to be hosted in Chicago at the WorldCon. Uh, the WorldCon's agreed to host it. So um, uh, I live in Chicago and happen to be on very good terms with people on the run uh, WindyCon. So uh, Chicago, WorldCon's hosting next year. Last year it was Nastrick. Year we, well, we've had it in Avacon, Conestoga. Westercon. Uh, I'm not Arizona. Uh, yeah, no, that was Westercon. And I don't know where we'll go after next year. We try to move it around. Now, uh, this, this, we've got, I think, a total of about a dozen panels. It's running all through today, tomorrow, and Sunday. Uh, Monday. 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 Monday, Monday to yeah. I myself will have to be leaving. I will do the first one on Monday, which is Snurking of Plots. What that is is. Um, Everyone has sworn to silence who comes to that one. I will tell you what's going to be happening when I'm coming to in the series. So if you don't want a spoilers, don't come to it. That'll be 10 o'clock Sunday. Then I will have to leave because I've got an early flight out. There's two more sessions after that. The program has me for one of them. I won't be here. Now, I did not program this whole program. She did. Uh, if I programmed them, we would be starting with a solemn two hours on the overall arching, you know, theme <laughs> of, of the 6032 series. He neglects to mention that I can't time down that long. And <laughs> uh, instead, we're going to start with Chaka. Uh, a low attempt to pull in customers. But in that spirit, I'm going to pass these out once. Just everybody take one. What this is, is... I do about once a year a seminar with Kevin Anderson, uh, Brandon Sanderson, who is a fantasy writer and he's picked up, he's finishing Wheel of Time series. Um, Dave Wolverton, who most of you may know, and he's better known under his pen name of Dave Farland, and Rebecca Mosta. The five of us do a, a, a three-day seminar that, well, this is a seminar you pay to come to, it's not freebie. But what it is, is it's a seminar on the business of being a writer. Uh, we're not, it's not a seminar on how to write. Uh, we sort of basically say, we'll take your word for it, you can write well enough to be a pro. What we will do is spend three days teaching everything we know about how the business works. So you have a practical idea of what to expect and where to go from there. Uh, if anyone wants to talk to them, by the way, Kevin and Karen have been to two of these already. And uh, so they can tell you what it's like if you want to talk to them. Um, and David also. All right, and these are just little bookmarks will give you information. So if you can just pass them around, and that'll be the last time I have a body about this. But uh, I promised Kevin, who is way more in promotion than I am, uh, <laughs> that I would pitch him here. Uh, and I'm doing some more. Right. <laughs> All right, and uh, with no further ado, and I will warn you, it starts really bitter because this was nasty stuff when it first emerged. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so hand it to the most bitter yeah, woman right. in the room. Hello. <laughs> All right, um, I write, I'm, my name is Karen Evans. I write for the Grantville Gazette. Um, that's how I got my CIFWA card, writing for the Grantville Gazette. I haven't yet seen any of my writing on paper. Everything has been electronic, so. But um, the first thing I wrote, I, I had read some of the, well, Kevin was a big fan and I read some of it and I, and I was, had started thinking about chocolate. And I've read 1632 and I've read 1633 and I began wondering, what are they gonna do about chocolate? Because whatever they brought with them is all they have, okay? When they land in Germany, there is no chocolate. There is none, okay? So whatever Nestle's bag of chips that you have in your kitchen, that's it, all right? Because the, there's no little store in town, okay, <laughs> that has the, 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 the chocolate bars. 
So I went in and I, and I researched it and I wrote an article about chocolate. It's called the, the Theobroma Shell Game and it's in, uh, in 13. 13? 15. 15. He knows. I don't care. <laughs> okay. Karen, yeah, it's important because we're at, we just finished publishing Brandville Gazette number 37. 37. We do six a year and we've just done 37. So this was... A while ago. This was a while ago, but I, I wrote the article, and basically, I looked at, I, I researched chocolate, and sugar, and vanilla. In the part of Germany where, where Grantville lands, there are none of those. Well, they have a little bit of sugar coming in, in trickles, but it's very expensive, okay? So if you're going to make chocolate, you're going to have an uphill road to climb, okay? First of all, um, I found this book. This is... Uh, the True History of Chocolate by Sophie D. Coe. Her husband's name is on it also because uh, what she did is she went all over the world and went in and looked at the archaeology all the way back to the Olmecs to find out where chocolate came from and how we have dealt with it. And then she had all of her notes together all the way up into modern history and she died. So her husband pulled all those notes together and, and published the book. That's why his name is on it. He didn't really write any of it, but so, you know, if, if you want to know about chocolate as, as much as I have found out about chocolate, this is the book to go to because she really knows. This is the book that the, the New York chefs are, are reading to find out about chocolate. Rick is here! Yay, Rick! Okay, so that's why that's here. I didn't write it. You've talked to Tony because you have a hat. I've talked to Mike, or Jim. Jim. Anyway. It, either way. Hi. All right. So in order to get from nothing to Hershey's, all right, it's quite a process. First of all, we have to talk about cocoa beans. They come from a tree called um, Theobroma, which is, is it Greek or is it Latin? Greek. Greek for food of the gods, okay? They, the trees grow pods about this big, about that size, or a little bit bigger, that come off the trunk of the tree. They don't grow on limbs or anything there. They're on the trunk of the tree. They're either green, yellow, or orange. And uh, you take that pod, and if you cut it in half, the stuff inside is white, okay? If you eat it, it tastes kind of like a fruity, fruity flavor, and there are big beans about the size of big uh, fava beans or a lima bean. That's the cocoa bean. Does not taste like chocolate when it's fresh. Okay? Does not. It tastes like, you know, a, a light tropical fruit. Okay? It's very good. It is very good. I, I have tasted a little bit of them. You can't really find them easily unless you go to Hawaii, Hawaii. or Mexico or somewhere they're growing. Okay? Because they don't transport well. So they take those, they take the beans out. They, it's called fermenting. What that means is they take the beans and the pulp out and they kind of put it in a pile and then let the sun on it and it rots. That's how the chocolate flavor gets into the beans, because it comes from the fruit. If you just took those beans out and roasted them automatically, they wouldn't taste like anything, okay? So you've got to ferment them, and then after you ferment them, you roast them. When you roast them, they break into little bits inside of the shell, inside of the little bean shell, and that's where you get cocoa nibs. Okay. I like cocoa nibs. They taste like chocolate, but they're bitter, you know, and crunchy. So this is the kind of chocolate that the Aztecs and the Olmecs had. And they would grind it up on, you know, you've seen those, those this stone grinders, and they put heat underneath it because there is so much cocoa fat in these that if you don't heat it up, you don't grind it, it just sticks to everything, okay? <laughs> it's a lot like peanut butter, I've tried. It is. <laughs> he tried it in a, in a coffee grinder. We can't use that coffee grinder. <laughs> okay? Had to go buy a new coffee grinder. But that's the cocoa nibs. They're good. You know, you can taste one. You get cocoa flavor. Not anything like this. Okay? <laughs> so that's what the Aztecs have. The Spanish show up. Here's Cortez looking for gold. And they come out and say, well, we have this drink that only the priests and the king can drink. But you are a white man with a beard, and you might be a god, so here, have some of this. Cortez <laughs> says, that's nice. What is it? And they said, cacao. The Spanish said, 
what did you say? Uh, it is an unfortunate. And it's kind of a you know weird brown color and it's foamy. Okay. They wouldn't you can try imagine it. Imagine where his mind went. They wouldn't try it. The first time they were offered, they wouldn't drink it. But they watched all these priests, you know, and the and they drank it and nobody threw up. You know, nobody seemed to have. I don't know, weird diseases. <laughs> so the next time they brought it out, they said, all right, wait, they try it. Well, what the Indians had done is they take their nibs and grind them up and put in some, some things that they had around like vanilla and chilies and so it was not sweet, okay? It was bitter, like coffee, and spicy, <laughs> okay? Coffee with jalapenos in it. And then they, they would foam it up. What the Aztecs did is they had cups and they'd pour it from a height like this until it, it foamed up. In other words, what they're trying to do is emulsify the fat into the whole thing and, and the foam is important. So that's what, that's what the Aztecs had. Well, so the Spaniards kept coming and kept coming and New Mexico, I mean, New Spain is built in Mexico City, which had been the capital of the Aztecs, right? And all of the ladies that came with the conquistadors and they built the, the cathedral and all of the ladies there decided, hey, this chocolate stuff isn't bad, but we're going to have sugar in it, okay? So they'd still grind it up, and they'd put cinnamon in it, and they'd put, you know, um, nutmeg was a big thing there because they had to ship it all the way from the Far East, you know, or um, things like that. They would put those things in it and sugar, and it became so addictive that they couldn't sit all the way through Mass without their chocolate, okay? So they'd be sitting there, the bishop is pontificating, the back doors open, in come this whole string of little maids running with little cups to bring their ladies chocolate so they could survive all of mass. <laughs> the bishop stood up and said, I'm going to excommunicate anyone who drinks chocolate. During the mass. <clears throat> During, well, he just said, who drinks chocolate? And the, uh, the governor talked him down <laughs> and said, you know, if you want anyone to come to mass, you have to just tell them, you have to last all the way through Mass, because if that door opens, I'm excommunicating you. But that, it became that popular. It was more popular than, than tea in England or, or you know, coffee in, in, in Turkey. It was that popular. So, of course, it made it to Spain. By now, it's like 1580. Okay, It takes a while for it to get popular in Spain, but you know, when, when they've spent their two or three years in, in New Spain and they come back, they're not going to live without their chocolate. So they bring it with them. Now by that time, this is, you can buy this in the store. This, by the way, is uh, called Lucre. It's the Mexican chocolate. You go to, you know, world, the world market or any Mexican market, and you can find this or, or a couple of other brands. And this is what it looks like. You break off a piece, you put it in hot water in a big pitcher, you take your Molinillo, which is a wooden whisk, and you whisk it up until it's frothy, okay? And that's what they're drinking. This is what chocolate looks like in Europe in 1630. And I'm going to pass a piece of this around. The glass. Well, yeah. This was dropping on the floor. Okay. You don't glasses. want to bite it. It's very hard. Okay. This is not Hershey's. You can listen to this. Don't bite it, but smell it. It smells really good. That's chocolate in 1630. This is what this is what they get. We can pass two pieces around if you want. I have a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like there's anything else you can do with it. You can't. You can't eat, eat it. Stuff. Trust this is kind of like eating eating uh, sweet Swedish cheese. What? There is sugar in it. Here, there is sugar in it. There is cinnamon.